U.S. History, we are doing part two of Unit 12. So this is generally talking Truman through Johnson. So Truman again took over for um, for FDR when FDR died. And then Johnson takes us, so we're, we're, we're talking mid-1940s. And then Johnson takes us up to the end of the 1960s. Okay, so yeah, last time we talked a little bit about um, the spread of communism, the Marshall Plan, about some of the, the just different aspects mainly of, of the Cold War. This continues certain aspects of the Cold War. Um, last time we also had like the House on American Activities Committee, the um, McCarthyism that was going on. Yeah, variety of things like that. So here, first we're going to talk a little bit about the Berlin Airlift and the Berlin Wall. So uh, let's see. So Berlin Airlift. Let's start looking at this map over here. So what happened was, in the aftermath of World War II, the Allied powers, which the main ones were United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union, they decided that they would, at least for a little while, split Germany into four separate regions, where each region was governed by one of those countries. And you have the little color coding here. The green area here was controlled by the United States, the yellow here by France, the purplish color here by Britain, and then the orangish color here by the Soviet Union. But not only that, but also Ber the city of Berlin. So the city of Berlin is right here. And then you have this little inset here. The city of Berlin, likewise, was split into four different sectors where each sector was controlled by one of those countries. So we have East Berlin here was the Soviet-controlled part. And then West Berlin here had the French part, the um, British part, and the U.S. part. Well, what happened was, and, and a little bit of inf information I have here, so... Um, what happened was the Soviet Union ended up blockading the western part of the city. Well, really, the city as a whole. And that happened from June 24th, 1948 to May 12th, 1949. So 1948 to 1949. And part of it involved the new currency that the United States had, um, had started to use in West Germany called the Deutschmark. And... Um, the Soviet Union had recently put its own new currency for East Germany to use, but the currency that West Germany was using was worth more, and East Germaners were starting to use that more. So there's a little bit of that going on. And um, yeah, the Soviet Union, among other things, wanted the United States to, well, generally speaking, wanted West Germany to stop using their new currency. And what they did is they cut off all modes of transportation from West Germany into West Berlin. So any roads that went to West Berlin, any canals that went to West Berlin, any river transportation that went to West Berlin, any railroads that went to West Berlin, the Soviet Union cut off all of that transportation, and the city of Berlin, especially West Berlin, was suddenly cut off from receiving any supplies that it would have received from West Germany. We're talking mainly food and coal. And the uh, the countries of the United States, Britain, and France had to try to decide what to do. And initially, a lot of people did not think it was feasible, but what they started to do was called the Berlin Airlift, where what they did is for about 15 months, they just had flight after flight after flight after flight, sometimes land, in an airport in West Berlin, uh, sometimes just parachute supplies into fields where they knew that it was safe to drop supplies. And um, at its peak, they had something in the range of 600 flights per day just to that city to drop off supplies. And there was a total of about 2.3 million tons of cargo that they delivered to West Berlin over the course of those 15 months. 
Uh, the majority of that, I think about two thirds of that was in, in terms of weight, about two thirds of that was coal because they still very much relied on coal for a lot of their industry and also just like warming their homes. Uh, the, of the remaining roughly one third, most of it was food, but also, I mean, stuff like milk and, you know, I don't know why that was coming to mind other than I recently saw a picture. It was them loading some milk up, but you know, milk, rice, a uh, wide variety of food supplies and medicine and variety of things like that. But yeah, over the course of those 15 months, we're talking about almost 300,000 flights into the city of Berlin. And eventually, the Soviet Union lifted the blockade and transportation was reopened between West Germany and West Berlin. But then what started to happen is as socialism in, in the, you know, the communist flavor with the Soviet Union started to be implemented more and more and to take hold in East Germany. There were more and more East Germaners, especially like skilled workers who could earn a good living because they had worked hard to get training and experience in order to have a job, you know, like doctor, lawyer, a uh, wide variety of types of occupations like that. And they, more and more, started to flee from East Germany to West Germany, and the point of contact that they would use for that was the city of Berlin. So they would be in East Berlin because they were from East Germany, and then they would cross into West Berlin and then work out some way to get transportation into West uh, Germany. So as you can imagine, a lot of people even people who didn't necessarily support the Soviet Union, a lot of East Germaners didn't like that because they were losing an important part of their labor force. And so up here, we have that from 1949 to 1960, there were about 2.7 million East Germans who escaped to West Germany via Berlin. So then... What happened was the Soviet Union in August of 1961 to, decided to start building a barricade. And initially it was barbed wire. It was just like people in the city of Berlin just woke up one morning in August 1961 to find that there were you know, barbed wire barricades uh, running through the middle of their city, separating the East Berlin part from the West Berlin part. And then before too long, it started to be able to become concrete wall. And you can see some of that here. Uh, that's the Brandenburg Gate, uh, I'm pretty sure. And yeah, so part of the wall here. Uh, through the city, the wall ran for about 27 miles in length. There were a few points of contact, the most famous of which was Checkpoint Charlie, where uh, there was a gap in the wall. Still, I, there were, ended up being like, you know, barbed wire on top of the wall and turrets and sometimes tanks and armed soldiers guarding the wall to keep people from East Berlin fleeing from communism to get into West Berlin. And it's always a sign that maybe your political and economic system is not that great when you have to build walls to keep your people in. You know, it's like the United States, the, the point of uh, debate about whether or not to build a wall involves not keeping Americans in the country, but keeping other people out and whether or not and to what extent that's an okay thing to do. And yeah, so the Berlin Wall went up in 1961 uh, and it ended up being kind of the symbol, as it were, for the Cold War. And then I have this Ich bin ein Berliner uh, because it's something that JFK said, John, President John F. Kennedy, one time that he visited, that he visited uh, the, yeah, that he visited Berlin. And it translated, it would be, I am a Berliner. In other words, he was saying like, I am one of you. I sympathize with you in your cause and what's happening in your city. But then shortly after that, some people started to say that President Kennedy had said, I am a jelly donut. 
And, and the reason why, so each is uh, each being that's basically the I am, and then Ein Berliner is is a or the you know person of Berlin, but a Berliner was also a term that was used for a jelly donut. And the way that the German works is if you if you are from Berlin and you're saying I'm a Berliner, you would just say Ich bin Berliner. That's how you would say it. But if you were referring to an object like a jelly donut, you would insert this Ein here and you would say Ich bin ein Berliner. And adding the ein would make it go from I am a person of Berlin to being I am a jelly donut. And so that's what a lot of people thought that, that uh, you know, obviously that JFK wasn't intentionally saying that, that it was an accident. But then linguists point out, it's like, well, no, he was speaking figuratively. He was, he, he, because he literally is not from Berlin, he was speaking figuratively. He was saying, I am, metaphorically speaking, a person from Berlin, because I sympathize with you. And if you are speaking metaphorically, then you should insert the ein, and so what he said actually was correct. But with that, let's do video question number four. Video question number four is, some people said that President JFK said that he was a what? And the answer is, jelly donut. Again, that was video question number four. Okay, next slide. So the other thing that's happening at this time is the Korean conflict. And I put Korean conflict, not Korean war, because we are looking at this through the lens of U.S. history. And the United States never declared war. So from the U.S. perspective, we should not really refer to it as the Korean war, because we did not, Congress did not declare war. Uh, for the Koreans, it very much was a war. Uh, the South Koreans usually call it the Korean War. The North Koreans call it the War of... No, the, the Homeland Liberation. Um, yeah. So, if the United States did not declare war, why were we fighting in it? Well, it's because it was directed by the United Nations. And, uh, yeah, so the United Nations was conducting this warfare... And as such, the United States provided the majority of the funding, the majority of the weapons, the majority of the personnel to fight this war. Uh, you might kind of wonder, well, if it was done by the United Nations, why did the Soviet Union or China not like veto that with their permanent Security Council veto powers? And what happened there was at the time, the United Nations had said that the version of China that should be on the Permanent Security Council was Taiwan, uh, Taiwan, the, um, the Republic of China, the non-communist people from China who ended up settling in Taiwan. And the Soviet Union didn't like that, and so the Soviet Union was temporarily boycotting the Security Council. And so the Soviet Union wasn't on there, and the version of China that was on there was the non-communist version of China, and so the United Nations was able to, in that context, was able to say, yeah, what's happening? Korea's not right. We should help support the South Koreans. So what was going on here is uh, after, so Korea for a while had been under Japanese control, but then after World War II ended, Korea was no longer under Japanese control. And kind of like what we saw with Berlin and with Germany, the Soviet Union in the United States basically carved Korea up and said, okay, well, here's what'll happen. The northern part of Korea here, the Soviet Union will be in charge of, and the southern part of Korea, the United States will be in charge of. And then the um, Soviet Union helped North Korea get a dictator in place and turn it into a communist or socialist state. And then the United States helped get a president in place and turn South Korea into a capitalist state. 
Well, then in um, we have a little kind of like little you know steps and timeline here. So 1945 to 1950, Korea is divided along the 38th parallel. That's so 38 degrees north. That line of latitude there. Uh, and then, part two, June through September of 1950, North Korea invades South Korea and war begins. And they invaded, see that little dash, that dashed line there? That was how far they got. And it was just this little corner is all that was left of what South Korea had control of when the United Nations got involved. Um... I mean, I think the United Nations got involved slightly before that, but it, it took a little bit to yeah to get things going. Then this city here is Incheon, and that was September 1950. Additional UN forces land at Incheon, and that was under the direction of General Douglas D. MacArthur. And then with that, then the United Nations slash mainly United States forces, it was the United States and South Korean forces mainly, uh, they start to push back, and they push things all the way back to this dashed line along here. And this river right here is the Yalu River. That goes along like that. Uh, so they push back at, at times actually to the North Korean-Chinese border, otherwise close to it, but not quite. Well, that was then uh, toward the latter end of 1950, when, oh no, that was their counterattack, yeah, yeah. But still, yeah, toward the, the tail end of 1950, when China started to join the fight, and they started to, the communist China, right, uh, they started to aid, and they would fight back. And what was kind of happening for a little while is a little bit of like China would attack across the border into the, the UN forces, and Douglas D. MacArthur, General MacArthur, would want to attack back, but he would receive word that, nope, sorry, you're not allowed to attack back, because the Chinese forces would oftentimes cross back into China. And the United States was still, a lot of people in the United States were still kind of like, well, maybe communism isn't that bad. And, well, China, we're, there, we're still kind of allies with China, and... He, so we have this Cold War is going on against the Soviet Union, but China, we, we maybe want to keep them kind of on our side. So we don't want to do anything to antagonize China. And uh, that was a lot of what was going on. And General MacArthur found that very frustrating. And it appears that he said he made some comments at some point or another about not really agreeing with how the war is being conducted and finding it a recipe for disaster to conduct war where the goal isn't really to win the war because that's kind of what was going on so with the aid of china then north korea pushes back pushes back and they got it uh so that was five they were talking about six u.n troops retreat from north korea and seven limit of communists advanced so they push things back to here when then South Korea and the UN slash United States started to push things back and they got things back to here. Armistice line is drawn where the fighting ends. And I think things have settled back to more specific, to you know being more closely aligned with the 38th parallel. Um, but that's where things stand to this day. There has not been an official treaty to end the war. It's just been in this kind of permanent ceasefire state where there's this demilitarized zone uh, where, where the boundary is, where um, there's just like this little no man's land where it's like, okay, neither side can go into this strip uh, in the middle, but... Right on the borders of that strip, South Carolina, or South Carolina, South Korea has their part very heavily guarded. North Korea has their part very heavily guarded. Uh, there was some stuff really in the news. Um, what was that like two years ago? I think when President Trump and 
President um, Kim Jong Un. No. Why? Uh, Kim Il Sun. Kim Jong Un. Yeah, Kim Jong Un, current president of, well, current dictator of North Korea, uh, had some talks there in that demilitarized zone. North Korea to this day is still, I'm pretty sure, holds the record as the as the most dictatorial, most totalitarian, most oppressive place to live. Um, it is, it, I mean, stuff like virtually zero contact with the outside world. I mean, like, no outside television, no outside internet, except just what North Korea wants you to see. Uh, depending where you live, you go long stretches of the year without any electricity. Uh, you cannot leave the country. Um, the the country the North Korea has worked it out so that most places, especially like along the Chinese border, any cell phone signals get shut down. Uh, but even then, cell phones have only in the last like six years maybe been something that a lot of South Koreans are allowed to have now. And the main reason why the North Korean government decided to allow them to have it is because of GPS tracking and because of information grabbing and because you can monitor your citizens much better if they are using a device where you know where the device is and you know what information the device sends and receives. Uh, when the former dictator of North Korea passed away, there was something like a month of mandatory public mourning. Uh, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, mourning, like grieving, where if you were in public for the next month or so, you had to show visible signs of grieving and mourning and like wailing and weeping because of the loss of your quote-unquote beloved leader, because uh, that's what they're usually supposed to refer to their, uh, their leader as, their beloved leader. Um, when North Korea was in the last World Cup, soccer tournament there was a relatively small group of fans who were allowed to go and to cheer for the north korean soccer team and it was something like they were watched 24 7 they were handpicked to be people that they were pretty sure would well they would cheer well because that's what they were going to be forced to do and they, they were pretty sure they were people who would not try to flee. It turns out several of them did get away from the group somehow and um, found it as an opportunity to, yeah, to flee. When the North Korean soccer team did well, the official narrative was that it was because they did the strategy and they played in the way that their beloved leader hadn't had told them to. And when the North Korean soccer team did not do well, it was because they were not carefully enough following the instructions of their beloved leader. A wide variety of people are regularly arrested and imprisoned, uh, even executed. Uh, two of the top groups are Christians and homosexuals. Um, they are constantly fed this narrative of your life is so much better than life in the rest of the world. And they'll, they'll do, the, the, the people in charge of propaganda in North Korea will do stuff like take stock footage, of, you know, video footage of like homeless people in the United States or people standing at a in line at a food truck, and they'll give their narrative of like these homeless people living in the snow. This is what life is like for all Americans. Or like they'll grab some news clip of like some guy who had a shed in his backyard that got partially destroyed by uh, a storm, and they're like, "This is practically a mansion in the United States." And then the people standing in line at a food truck in like Chicago in the snow a little bit. And like, and this is people who are waiting for a handout because they have no food. 
and this truck is distributing melted snow that will sustain them for the day. And just, yep. And that's... Uh, so the people in the country are just regularly told, you actually should be glad because your life is actually better than anywhere else in the world. And the people in the country have no contact or access to finding out what life is actually like in the rest of the world. So, yeah. Let's do video question number two. Video question number two. What line marks the boundary between North and South Korea? What line marks the boundary between North and South Korea? And the answer is the 38th parallel. Parallel spelled P-A-R-A-L-L-E-L. 38th parallel. Again, that was video question number two. So dead and missing from this war, about 162,000 from South Korea, about 37,000 from the United States, about 5,000 from other countries, about 500,000 North Koreans, and about 200,000 People's Republic of China or, or Communist China. But this is one of the really sad parts. The number of civilians killed between 2 and 3 million. Uh, the majority of those were... North, well, that was, I think about, it was something like around 1.5 million North Korean civilians killed and almost 1 million South Korean civilians killed. And that's that 38th parallel that we were talking about. Okay, moving on. A little bit about what was happening in, in Cuba. So Cuba, uh, I mentioned here, Fidel Castro's Cuban Revolution. Uh, Cuba had been ruled by a military dictator. He wasn't that great of a guy, but yeah. But Fidel Castro led a revolution, lasted you know, about five years here. And that revolution ended up overthrowing President Batista uh, and put in Fidel Castro as the new dictator and he aligned himself with the Soviet Union. And Cuba, up to that point, had very close ties to the United States. I, mean, I think it's like 90 miles, 60 miles, I want to say 90 miles, from the southern tip of Florida down to Cuba here. And a lot of tourists would go to Havana, among other places. Um, Cuba would buy a lot of goods from the United States. The United States bought quite a few goods from Cuba. And yeah, so Cuba had very close ties to the United States, but when Fidel Castro made himself an ally with the Soviet Union, uh, he virtually cut off all of the trade and connection with the United States. Now, there were a bunch of people who supported and wanted a free Cuba, you know, who were Cubans, and had fled to the United States, mainly to the United States. And the United States helped train them, and this was the Counter-Revolutionary Brigade 2506. And the plan, there were about, I think, 1,800 of them. And uh, so this, these were, yeah, people who, people who had fled Cuba, and they were trained by the U.S. military. And the plan was for them to come some from here, some from down here in Central America, and and then some from over here in Puerto Rico, and to land in this bay, this Bay of Pigs, right up in here. And with those troops on the ground, combined with the U.S. military, uh, and, sorry, the U.S. Air Force giving air support, that they were pretty sure that these 1,800 soldiers, combined with airplanes giving them support, and protection and cover, could make their way to Havana and overthrow Fidel Castro's regime and retake Cuba to be a free place. And the time came, and President Kennedy was, he was still having second thoughts about how good of a, how good of a decision this was and what the repercussions of it could be. And the gist of what happened was the land forces started to do their thing, and the air support never came. And it was a total failure. 
And so the Bay of Pigs invasion, sometimes it's just called the Bay of Pigs. Sometimes it's called the Bay of Pigs disaster, the Bay of Pigs fiasco, stuff like that, because all of those troops ended up getting killed or captured. I think all of them. So that happened. Uh, but then the next year, the Cuban Missile Crisis happened. And this was, most would say, the most tense that the, um, that the Cold War ever got, the closest to warfare that the Cold War ever got. There were guys working in the U.S. government at the time who had, you know, who had private information, secret information about what was going on and they would say goodbye to their families every morning and go to work with the back of their minds recognizing I might never see my family again because we are so close to nuclear warfare that it's there's a decent chance today that a Soviet nuclear warhead could detonate onto Washington, D.C. and obliterate us and I will never see my wife and, and kids again. Uh, so what had happened, though, was the United States had missiles stationed in Italy and Turkey that put those missiles in a range where they could potentially fire nuclear bombs onto the Soviet Union. And so kind of in retaliation to finding out about that, the Soviet Union started to place missiles in Cuba. And this right here is part of the image that was captured that showed some of these missiles, these guided missiles. And then there's like, you know, missile transportation, some vehicles for transporting missiles, some heavy equipment. This is just like roughly the top third of the image. And this would have been an image that was taken by one of these aircraft. I mentioned here the U-2. This U-2, uh, it's a Lockheed aircraft U-2, could fly around 70,000 feet elevation. That's roughly double the elevation that you would fly in a commercial aircraft going from, you know, like from one side of the United States to the other. So these things could fly super high for a long time, and they could take pictures like this to get intel. And with that, let's do video question. Let's see, we did four and then two. Uh, let's do video question number five. Video question number five is what type of airplane was very important in getting secret information during the Cold War, you know, taking photos, basically? And the answer is U-2, the U-2. Again, that was video question number five. Well, so in response to finding out about the Soviet missiles in Cuba, the United States did a naval blockade of Cuba, where the United States sent uh, naval ships and set up a blockade to basically say, hey, um, Cuba and Soviet Union, you, well, Cuba, you're doing most of your trading with Soviet Union now. Well, we are going to blockade this, and no Soviet naval or Soviet uh, merchant ships can get through here. That's kind of the setting, if any of you saw, what was it, X-Men First Class, I think, where, um, where, well, yeah, I, I don't want to say too much about what might give anything away, but the Soviet missile crisis, and then in particular this naval blockade was part of the setting that ended up be, being kind of like some of the big action that happened toward the end of that X-Men movie. Well, so while this is going on, and at times things were getting so close to breaking out into war, there were some secret negotiations that were happening, and those secret negotiations ended up leading to some agreement for some concessions between the United States and the Soviet Union, and it was kind of along the line of Soviet Union saying, hey, if you guys remove your missiles from Italy and Turkey, we'll remove our missiles from Cuba. And nuclear warfare was averted. All right, next slide. 
So just a little bit about JFK, the space race, LBJ, and Great Society. So JFK is President John F. Kennedy. He was president from 1961 to 1963 until he was assassinated on 11 63 So it's November 22nd, 1963. And I was in Dallas, Texas. Uh, I've been to that site. Um, and there, the floor of the building where the where Lee Harvey Oswald took the shot from, uh, it's, it's a museum now dedicated to talking about the assassination and the, you know, well, yeah, in general, talking about the assassination. Uh, this is President Kennedy. That's President Kennedy there as well uh, On as part of the motorcade. And then, so was, this was pretty shortly, just like right before he was shot. In the site now, they have a little white X painted in the street where he was shot. And it just didn't feel right when I was there that there were a bunch of people who would be like, oh, here, take my phone. Or, you know, like there there would be a group of people and like one of them would, would take the camera or, or, or the person's phone and then one or two of them is, is still a street that has, you know, traffic, but they would wait for a break in the traffic and then like a, a person or two would go stand on the X and smile while someone took their picture. I'm like, that, that just doesn't feel right when this site is marking the location where someone was shot and killed. Uh, any person being shot and killed in this spot, let alone our president of the United States, and just like be like all touristy about it, like, okay, smile for the picture. It just it didn't feel right. Uh, well... Shortly into his presidency, on May 25th, 1961, JFK announces a plan to land a man on the moon. Now, at this point, there's there had been a total of 15 minutes in space at that point for an American, you know, a, a person from the United States being in space. 15 minutes of space time. They had barely made it into space. I forget how many miles up, but I think it's less than 10 miles up is where you are, so I want to say it's like seven miles up, is where you're now considered to be in outer space. So they had barely spent 15 minutes barely into space. The moon is over 200,000 miles away. And JFK announced that, yeah, not just we're going to do this, but before the end of the decade, we're going to do this. And there were a bunch of people with NASA, who were like, uh, wait, I'm sorry, we're going to do what? How soon? And it was just a fascinating story of the developments that they made and the, the, the progress that they made and how they were able to make that happen on, if I recall correctly, uh, July 21st, 721, 69? That sounds right, but I don't remember for sure. But it happened. And it's a super fascinating story. Uh, let's do video question number one. When JFK announced that the United States would land a person on the moon, how much time had Americans spent in space up to that point? And the answer is 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Um, yeah, so JFK was assassinated. His vice president was LBJ, and LBJ became president, and he was president from 1963 to 1969. And one of the big things that he's remembered for is his great society. A little side note, LBJ is, I'm pretty sure, my least favorite president. Just in addition to not agreeing with many, many, many of his policies. Uh, I just also think he was just, yeah, he did and said many despicable things. Uh, just his behavior at times. I won't even get into the details because this is very crude and disgusting. 
ways that he would respond sometimes to reporters, for example, when a reporter asks, by what authority, you know, what, what like authorizes you to um, send troops into the Vietnam War and to make some decisions that you make? Uh, he used intimidation a lot. He was six foot four and would just, the, the way that he interacted with others, it, it was y- using a lot of bodily intimidation, um, swearing. Uh, the, uh, there's some evidence that he was behind the JFK assassination, though. I don't know if there's enough evidence to really make a strong enough of a case for that. Uh, he had been the um, head of the Senate, so he was very, very powerful from that standpoint. And in many ways, he took a step down in authority to become vice president. Um, oh, yeah, that reminds me. Uh, video question, let's see. So we did... Oh, I knew I should have written this down beforehand. We did... Oh, I just lost track. Wait. I want to say that three is what's left. Video question number three. The question is, JFK is the only U.S. president of what religion slash denomination? So number three, JFK is the only U.S. president of what religion slash denomination? And the answer is Roman Catholic. He is the only Roman Catholic president. And I don't want to kind of trash on LBJ and make it seem like JFK was a a great person. He had his own issues with known extramarital affairs and super foul mouth and stuff like that as well. But anyway... Okay, so LBJ, and so his great society. Some people think that it was a great thing. I disagree with a lot of the policies, but also some, quite a few historians think that the main motive that LBJ had for doing his great society stuff was not so much out of a genuine care to help Americans in need, but it was more of to pass stuff that would make him go down as a great president in American history. But some of the stuff in his Great Society was the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And one of the things that that did is it said that public places cannot be segregated and also that a uh, a company hiring people could not make hiring decisions based on race. Then in general, there was this war on poverty. And that's one of the, the things like, okay, war on poverty started in the 1960s. And how has that gone? How... The policies and all of the money that has been poured into trying to end poverty in America, and poverty is actually worse than it was. Hmm, interesting. Uh, there's the Food Stamp Act. Medicare Medicare is basically, it is, it is government-funded um, medical, what am I trying to say? Medical, like health coverage for the elderly. Medicaid, kind of similar, but a little bit different. I'm, I think I'm going a little bit long on this video. I'm trying to cut it short. And, and, but also things like the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, you know, government funds that are going to try to help promote aspects of the arts, whether it be things involving national public radio or artists doing paintings or um, funding you know, live performances and stuff like that. Uh, And then even PBS was something that came out of LBJ's Great Society. Okay, so that's that. Uh, Because I lost track, I feel like I might have only done four questions instead of five. And if so, just leave the one blank that I didn't do. And um, I won't ding you against that. So that'll be all right. Okay. So that kind of wraps up what we're talking about for this unit. There's a little bit about the GI Bill and about how that played a role in leading to college costs being as expensive as they are, but I'm not going to take the time for that right now. Uh, 
So that wraps up unit 12. And um, as I mentioned in RenWeb and on uh, Google Classroom, I decided not to put the unit 12 test at the end of this week, but instead the beginning of next week, really any time next week, because you don't have to do it on a specific day, but I recommend beginning of next week. And I did that partially so that you could have some time, a little bit more time in the second half of this week to review and study so that you're a little bit more ready for that test. And I really hope it goes well. Thanks.